Good evening and welcome all to the Muscle Help Foundation Charities 36th In Conversation with Broadcast, hosted by myself, Michael McGrath. If you're joining us for the very first time, a very warm welcome to tonight's show. As many of our loyal followers will know, these conversations are informal in nature, uh, where interesting conversations take place with interesting guests and personalities are invited to share their, their stories and their insights. And as the host, well, I try to encourage free-flowing, long-form conversations with a little fun and getting up close and personal with our quick-fire rounds. Ultimately, these conversations are designed to speak first and foremost to our tribe of muscle warrior families, our community across the UK, children and young people between the ages of 8 and 28 years who have the muscle wasting disease, muscular dystrophy. And they're also an opportunity for families and, of course, those with an interest or connection with a guest to also tune in. So to all the mums and dads, brothers and sisters, uncles and aunties, PAs and carers, plus our charity friends and supporters, welcome to you all. It's my hope that these conversations uh, enlighten and uplift, but also attract new audiences and by default, desperately needed support for the charity's vital work during these still difficult times. Before we welcome tonight's guest, a few quick housekeeping points. Firstly, a safeguarding note. As always, we have eyes over tonight's show, streaming live on the charity's Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn channels. So if any inappropriate comments are observed, action will be taken. And secondly, all in conversation with shows are recorded, meaning that audiences in this country or indeed anywhere across the globe can watch past episodes whenever they want to. So after tonight's show, that'll be 36 episodes to watch. So head over to the charity's YouTube channel, search for DreamMaker657, don't forget the double M in the middle, and hit the subscribe button. And for those that don't know, there will be a third series kicking off in March 2022 with 12 shows across the year. That's one a month. So please be sure that you opt in to receive the charity's information and news updates. And of course, it goes without saying that if you'd like to learn more about the charity's impact, maybe you're looking for a charity to adopt or perhaps you're looking for a new fundraising challenge. After all, it's the new year, the start of a new year. Either way, do please get in touch and let's see how we can collaborate and support you in your endeavors. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my real privilege to introduce uh, tonight's guest, our first show of 2022. Please, please give it up for Josh Wintersgill. Hi Josh, Good how's it going? Hi. Very well, thanks. I'm very pleased and delighted to be here. Excellent. It's great to have you with us this evening. Before we get going, I've got to ask, Josh, where are you in the UK tonight? I'm down in uh, Somerset. So for those of you festive folks that like your muddy fields, uh, we're very close to Glastonbury Festival. So if that gives you an idea, we're right down in the southwest of the UK. Excellent. Excellent. So so let's let's get going. I know that this... Um, this wretched pandemic has disrupted many people's lives. And as someone with spinal muscular atrophy type 3, I believe you were diagnosed yeah. shortly after birth. Perhaps you can tell us more about how SMA type 3 affects you, but also with the pandemic, tell us about its impact on your life, Josh. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, SMA type 3 has, in, in, you know, impacts me very similar to those uh, with muscular dystrophy, of course, it's that neuromuscular uh, wastage condition. And um, I was, the, the, my journey with SMA has been a, you know, I'd say a very interesting one. Type three with an SMA is quite broad. So you can have individuals that can walk in adulthood and then you get uh, people like myself where actually I really struggled to walk from, from the age of, you know, two and three. And I, I grew up using a walking frame um, which I, I couldn't really walk. I could never really walk unaided. Um, and it got to the point where I would probably say I got my first electric chair actually when I was six. I wasn't the best of drivers, had numerous accidents. Um, the classic one is when you're when you're young and more mobile, you see it's uh, it's very easy to not to forget to turn off your wheelchair. 
And I remember the first one of the first experiences I had, I was outside my mum's house and I, I used to be able to push myself up onto my foot plates and then from my foot plates into my chair. And one day I was pushing myself up into my seat and my arm slipped and my sleeve on my T-shirt got caught on my joystick. And because I forgot to turn the, the wheelchair off, I drove myself straight into the house. Um, and I mum just heard this massive scream and come running out. And there's me crashed into the wall like proper, oh you know, God. hunched over with my legs stuck. So, you know, that was that was my one of my first experiences. And then I got to 10, I stopped walking. I then became, um, I, I was then, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a wheelchair from then on, I could wait there till I was 14. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got, I, I had scoliosis of the spine. So I ended up having a correction of that curvature at 14. Mm-hmm. And from that moment, I then, I was then uh, to the point where I had to be hoisted. So I couldn't wait there at all. So I've permanently been hoisted and using an electric wheelchair now since the age of 14. So I'm now 28. So, you know, on the high end of the, of the young people that you support through the Muscle Health Foundation. So, you know, I've been reliant on care um, all my life. Um, I'm, I'd like to think I'm fairly independent. Um, I've, you know, um, made, I've taken I've taken the, the most of the mobility that I have to get to where I am today. Um, so I, you know, I li- I've been living independently since I was 18, um, you know, drive a car, uh, managed to go to university, um, get a job. And, and I'm sure we'll touch a lot on that later on, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of my journey with SMA to date so far. How's the pandemic affected you? <sighs> the, massively, if I'm being honest, Michael, um, it's it's turned my world upside down from the point mm. that uh, I wouldn't say necessarily upside down. I think it's it's well it has and it's kind of given me an opportunity to reset. So I was living independently in Bristol with my sister and a lodger. We had a really nice barn conversion, and I had carers coming in and out doing doing my care. I was running my business, doing my hobbies, and you know it was all going well. Um, and then COVID hit, and because of the nature of it and my family were quite scared and I had about four or five carers coming in and out and I had a lodger that lived with me who worked in a care home and my sister was going out doing her work and everyone was like well it's probably best Josh for you to come home because this is very serious and if you catch yeah. it, it it could likely kill you um and so I came home and I've been living with my nan now since March of 20 what is it 2019 so coming up two years and at my nan's house, we don't have, um, I don't have a wet room. I don't have access to a toilet. So I've been having bed baths for the last two years. I've been having to go into a commode and I've had to kind of scale everything back um, into kind of, uh, you know, living back home with family. And it's quite a strange adjustment when you work so mm-hmm. hard to be independent and go mm-hmm. through the motions of leaving home, going to uni, doing all of that stuff. And then all of a sudden being kicked back to home through no fault of your own. And actually it's, um, yeah, it's been, it's been tough to adjust, but I've been very lucky. I've got a very good family and very good and looked after me very well. So I was very fortunate um, to be where I am um, because I know there's many people out there that don't necessarily have the support around them. And mm. I can only, um, I can, I can only consider myself very grateful um, to have that support over the last two years. Can you see, in 2022 a pathway towards that towards another readjustment back to your sort of old your old ways of doing things i do you know i think it's actually i'm going to go into new ways of doing things michael i okay. think um I, I i i've put up with a lot in terms of compromises and i yep. think i'm now 28 and i don't want to be having to fight and justify things all the time and it's getting yeah. to a point now where I kind of want to be a bit more settled. I was yeah. I was spent a lot of time in the private rented sector. And actually what I've learned with the neuromuscular condition that is deteriorating, that in order to um, in order to make the most of what you've got, you need to have a solid foundation day to day to enable you to not worry about all of the things that you need to fight for in life. You kind of want a house in place. You want consistency. You want it to be easy. Uh, without all of this other stuff that you have to fight for all the time and I've got mm. to a point now where I'm kind of getting I'm kind of done with that now and it's time yeah. to kind of settle down so I think I'm going to be more stern with what I want and be more driven to go out there and and kind of settle yeah just on the subject of SMA um mm. 
you know, for the for the sixty five or so babies born with SMA in England each year, most I believe don't live mm-hmm. past the age of two. I know there are some new drug interventions like Solgensma and also a drug called uh, Spiraza that targets the underlying cause of SMA. So there's kind of real hope, mm-hmm. isn't there, um, for the future? Oh, but I mean, it's it's unbelievable uh, in terms of how treatment has come on. I, I remember when I was younger, um, I never. I never expected treatment. So when I was younger, my mindset was, Josh, you've got to carry on with what you've got. You can't change it. You've got to work hard. You've got to do your exercises. You've got to look after yourself because you, you can't just sit there and hope that one day it's all going to be, you know, um, it's going to be there um, and, it, you know, everything's going to be perfect. The reality mm. is that back then it wasn't. Um, mm. And it's really hard, I think, depending on the individual and the mindset, being able to get around knowing that back then treatment wasn't available mm. um I would, I would imagine it was quite hard for people but now we're seeing so much more development in that medical space and there's a lot going on in the in the md space as well isn't there with treatment and i think they're getting very close now and with zolgensma it's fantastic because we are actually seeing real good efficacy of the drug um you know we've just seen recently that the 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 government or the nhs have now approved um, for babies mm-hmm. to have Zolgensma, mm-hmm. which is a once, a one-time um, injection, yep. I believe, um, that pretty much eradicates SMA. Um, and I think they're seeing very good progress in the UK of that at the moment. And then you've got Spinraza, um, which is a, a, um, a lumbar puncture, effectively, yep. or, or of that kind into the spinal cord. But that comes with inherent risks. Um, and there's a lot of um, criteria around it that... Mm allows people to get access to it um and so there's been a third drug uh, called risdaplan which has just been approved um it was originally only available for type 1 and type 2 individuals mm. with sma and they've just recently um allowed access to the treatment for people with sma type 3 um, and so a lot of people with sma type 3 are now enrolling onto the program to have access to risdaplan and see how their treatment goes um and i was only having a conversation with about it today so speaking of, you know, leading fulfilling lives, you've been described, Josh, as a multi-talented and highly successful young British entrepreneur. Um, okay. And in 2018, as I discovered, you won the UK Stelios Awards for Disabled Entrepreneurs for a startup called Easy Travel Seat. Um, so Correct. tell us more. Oh, God. Okay, so... I mean, for people watching, um, you'll probably be very familiar with the Orange and the EasyJet um, and and the airline industry. And I I think a lot of people watching will really relate, especially if your children are kind of in powered chairs where they're not as mobile, that actually air travel is extremely challenging. And I think you've had a guest on here um, not so long ago, Mr. Christopher Wood with Flying Disabled. Um, trying to, you know, get us folk to be able to just roll onto an aircraft in our chairs and go and explore the world uh, like everybody else um, without having all of the difficulties that are associated with air travel. And a couple of years ago, I got very, very frustrated um, with the experience of getting from my wheelchair onto the aircraft and the inconsistencies of the way in which special assistance is delivered around the world. And I thought, well, rather than relying on airports to deliver the same standards and the same uh, equipment to enable me to get from my chair to the aircraft I thought why not just create something that I can have that I can take with me on an aircraft and 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 use it wherever I am in the world to get in and out of my chair Mm. but do it in a way that's different to the way conventional slings work so I, I thought well let's take the concept of a seat and let's take the concept of a sling Um, and combine the two and ensure that when we are being lifted from our wheelchair onto the aisle chair and then into the aircraft at all times you're maintaining pressure relief Um, it's it's a real when you're sat in a fantastically comfy perfect chair that's designed for you sitting in a tiny little seat that's got no cushioning or no support is extremely uncomfortable it's extremely undignified Um, and I thought well we can't have somebody sitting on an aisle chair for you know, five five minutes and then developing a pressure sore. You know, we recently saw a lady in the US who um, was really badly mistreated um, and ended up developing a pressure sore, which ended up causing her to die. 
and it's just not acceptable. So I designed this product to basically enable more appropriate, safer and dignified transfers on and off aircraft. And I was very fortunate that the the gentleman, Sestelios, who was running the awards, just so happened to be the founder of one of Europe's largest budget airlines. <laughs> and that was a coincidence, by the way. I didn't know that until I uh, until about a day before I went up to meet him. So, yeah. you know, there Excellent. we are. Very good. So look, we both have something in common. So we've experienced the joys of the Jubilee Sailing Trust. Um, uh-huh, so, yes. so come on, how, how did your easy travel seat perform in the Caribbean? Was it Antigua, you were at, was it last year or the year before? Or top of, when, when did you go? Uh, it was, it was, it was February of 2019. Uh, right. So we went with the Jubilee Sailing Trust. We w- went out on um, Tenacious uh, because yes. I think they, Lord Nelson was retired, wasn't it? So we yeah. went out on Tenacious and do you know what, Michael? I had no idea what I was letting myself in for, uh-huh. right? You know, if, if, if you take a, uh, you know, a typical individual with MD or SMA, you know, that re- requires hoist transfers, profiling beds, the lot. If, if somebody was to tell me what I was going to go through on that trip, I would never have gone. I would never have gone in a million years, right? But I went with no expectations. I had to adapt through the whole trip. And it was probably the most exhilarating but scary holiday I've ever done. Um, I nearly fell out of my wheelchair twice. I was in a manual wheelchair. So I the thought of not being in an electric chair for 10 days was quite overwhelming. Like seven days, actually, it was quite overwhelming. Yeah. And we had a tiny little hoist on a single bracket with swells swinging with hoist and a little bunk bed. Uh, we had a portable chair. I mean, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> um, but I tell you what, my hat, my hat off to the crew. I mean, they were yeah. amazing. Um, you know, such a wonderful charity, wonderful people. Um, and they really made it an experience. And I remember with the easy travel seat, uh, I actually used it to be winched up to one of the masts. Um, yes. And there's a really good video of me somewhere on YouTube where you can see me being hoisted in my own product Excellent. up to the top of the mast <laughs> overlooking the Caribbean Sea. And I tell you, it was that kind of an, it was like an, that was an epiphany moment where you think, <laughs> you know, you feel on top of the world, right? Because you've, you've created something that's enabled you to get up to the top of a mast in the Caribbean. It was just, yeah, it was an amazing holiday. I'm thinking Forrest Gump here, but we'll talk about that later. Listen, there's a there's a scene in that particular film where he's up the top of the mast. But anyway, I had That's a great right. experience on on board Lord Nelson many many years yeah. ago, and as you quite rightly say, you know that's a it's a phenomenal charity and um, supported by uh, and people working for that charity are extraordinary. For me, it was a it was a very memorable experience. So listen, you're also the founder. Mm and mm-hmm. director of a business called Able Move, a business that you also started in 2018, um, a business that I discovered thrives on, and I love this, by the way, attitude, imagination, and fun. Um, yep. Tell us a little bit more about Able Move. Where are you at? Yeah, Able Move was the core business when we started, and Stelios saw the product and wanted us to brand with the Easy brand. Um, but it very quickly dawned on me that the brand caused us a few conflicts and actually the Able Move brand was going to enable us to grow without barriers in terms of how people perceive um, the Easy brand. And I didn't really see that at the time. And what we've done is we've grown our portfolio out. So we've now created a wider range of really useful living aids for wheelchair users. And what my goal now is, is to keep innovating and to create more products for the future so that, um, you know, we we are creating solutions by disabled people for disabled people and often we see that that products and services are often designed by people with no necessarily real experience or are not bringing the right people in the room at the right times when bringing products to market and it causes all sorts of problems and i often find that with healthcare in particular or medical products they're so they're so outdated they're so in the past now i agree they're there to serve a function but actually the younger generation coming through now, you know, the eight to 10 year olds and the, and, the, and the teens, they're so much more aware about how they're being perceived by people out there. They want to feel confident. They don't want to be sat, sat in something that doesn't make them feel good. They don't want horrible clothes. They want easy, smart, accessible clothes. Um, they want to feel good about themselves. And I just feel that we need to bring innovation into a new world that's fit for the generation that's coming through and what i kind of want to do now is continue innovating bringing 
you know, uh, wheelchair users into what we're doing and actually design products that's going to, you know, be really fit for, for the people that need to use them. Um, so we are, we've got another three products lined up this year. I don't know if we're going to get all of them to market, but we'll definitely get one or two of them. I hope. So these three products, uh, we've got a, another pick lined up. These three products over and above these oh, wow, okay. uh, screen at the minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the, you've got us, you've got our slings, which are fantastic. Yeah. uh that can be used with or without a hoist then we've got our own leg straps um which are very good at keeping your legs together if you've got no stability there um and then our other really popular one is the bottom left which is our ar wheelchair cover so when people are being out of say the swimming pool or hydro or a jacuzzi or perhaps you might be getting out of your bathroom and rather than sitting on a shower chair that's really uncomfortable you can pop this straight over to your electric chair if you've got a ceiling track hoist through and you can get into your own chair and this cover keeps your chair completely dry so no more having to stack towels over your wheelchair to keep it dry um, mm -hmm. again very simple very simple solution um, that does what it says on the tin Great stuff. I mean, keep innovating, Josh, because what you're doing is phenomenal and you're providing solutions to people that are, 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 are so, so helpful. Um, but listen, you know, putting the pandemic to one side, what yeah. single piece of advice would you perhaps give to a young person today living with a disability, perhaps thinking about starting up their own business? Um, probably, um, I would say never let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Um, I... Uh, and and if, if somebody does, um, you politely to tell them to turn around and walk away and never come back again. Um, because I think that the moment you allow people to um, squash your dreams and hopes, um, you're you're constantly fighting an uphill battle. And, you know, we've already got enough to deal with with our conditions. We don't need that negativity around us. So I think, yeah, never, ever let anybody say you can't do something. And I think that's the way I've been brought up. <laughs> It's great advice, Josh. So yeah. listen, if you'd like to learn more about Able Move and how, if you're a wheelchair user, it can help you improve day-to-day -day living, give you greater confidence, freedom, and choice, um, head to ablemove.co.uk. And of course, if you'd like to just say hello or put a question directly to Josh uh, this evening, you know what you need to do. Pop your question on whatever channel you're watching on, be it LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, and a member of our volunteer online studio team will pick it up. I'm just going to jump into the chat room for a second. Hi, David. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Any other questions, please do pop them in the chat room as we go through this evening's conversation. So, Josh, just before we chat some more, a little bit of a gear yeah. change. Um, you'll hopefully okay. be familiar with our quick fire rounds, allowing our audience to get to know our guests just a little bit better, right? So... Josh, you ready for okay. this? I was born ready. Start with Why is a book written by Simon Sinek. Very good. One song that puts Josh in a great mood. Oh, God. Um, oh, God, I can't remember what I put now. <laughs> oh, there's lots. Um, I'm going to say. Oh, uh, I don't know. I'm going to say Jack Johnson, Better Together. Nice. So, Josh, what is the effective range of a .22 air rifle? Is it A, 15 to 20 metres, B, 20 to 25 metres, or C, 35 to 40 metres? Oh, you've got me off guard now. This is <laughs> never good. Um, We're going to talk about shooting, shooting a little colleagues. bit later. I hope my shooting colleagues aren't work, uh, watching. So two twos could be around twenty odd yards. Um, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say C. Correct. Well done. Most used emoji oh. on your smartphone. <laughs> oh, the most used emo emoji. Um, do you know what? I'm a bit of a cheeky chap, so it's probably it's probably got to be the little winky one with the like the little smug face. Um, I, I probably. Over yeah, or the laughy face with lots of laughter, laughter, laughter tears. Um, I kind of overuse that a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So the names, Lorraine Lambert, Matt Scullin, James Beavis, Ryan Cockbill, Issy Bailey and Tim Jeffrey. What yep. do they all have in common? Well, they, they, they all like shooting. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and they all, they all shoot for Great Britain. Yeah, that's right. There, there was the, the, the Team GB's Paralympian shooting squad for Tokyo 2020, wasn't it? 
Yeah, I don't know. I was very disappointed actually with the um, um, with the broadcasters. Um, Air Rifle never seems to get the credit that it deserves as a sport. Um, and actually, I, I really hope that people that end up watching this or are watching now really consider um, encouraging their children, um, or even if you are in your twenties or teens, to actually pick up a rifle. Um, in Tokyo, we actually saw a, a young Swedish chap called Philip Jonsson, who actually won gold in R4, um, and he's got muscular dystrophy, and he's the first person with muscular dystrophy to win a gold medal. So Fantastic. the fact, what I'm trying to get across is that if you've got muscular dystrophy or if you have a neuromuscular condition, whatever your condition, air mm -hmm. rifle is probably, other than botcha, air rifle is, yeah. in my opinion, one of the most accessible sports that you can compete at at the highest level. And you can do it from your home. Um, so I would highly encourage people to check it out. We're going to come on to that a little bit later in the conversation. Good. One Good. item that you take to a desert island, Josh. Uh, one item. Well, I'm hoping I've got my wheelchair with me, to be honest. <laughs> with what? With a solar panel on it to keep the keep the batteries charged, right? Absolutely, um, and a couple of uh, a couple of air rifles on the back, just in case I get attacked by some strangers. <laughs> there you go. We'll, we'll let we'll let you have those. Listen, in the movie Forrest Gump, how many Dr. Peppers did Forrest drink before meeting President Kennedy? Was it three? Oh my God! <laughs> Fifteen or forty-five? Have a guess. Um, it's in the bar. I think it's three, isn't it? Fifteen. That's okay. Is it when, fifteen? Yeah. When brushing your teeth. Bamboo, yeah. plastic, or electric toothbrush? Uh, electric toothbrush. And Josh, finally, in this particular round, you're the PM for 24 hours. Mm. One change that you'd make today? Um, I'd probably get rid of nuclear weapons. Okay. Now, I'm going to pop up a series of photos, Josh, and perhaps I could invite you to tell us, you know, just tell us a little bit more about what's going on. Okay. So let's go to... Let's go to our first uh, our first pick. What's okay, so this here? was an this was an honorary master's degree that I was awarded by the University of West of England uh, for my contribution to um, the wider public and people with disabilities, and it was a, an, an honorary master's in technology. Fantastic, and we're going to pop, pop up another pick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was at Lucknam Park. Uh, it's a it's a resort, and I was there with my partner at the time. Uh, and we have we're having afternoon tea. <clears throat> now I know Lutton Park very well, so here's a bit of a shout out to Lutton Park, having stayed there a few times myself. Because I looked at that image and I thought, I know that, no. I know that <laughs> avenue of trees uh, where they used to hide yep. Spitfires in the war under those trees, didn't they? Because they they arch the trees arch across that beautiful long avenue. Um, yeah. But uh, but anyway. Yeah, they. They have helicopters and that on the right that land in on the right hand side and we were going right. past quite a few of them. So and you're in a permobil chair. Have you been doing some work with permobil? Um, I do a little bit of support with them from an EMEA perspective. Um, yeah. A couple of things actually that might be relevant. So I'm actually trying to encourage permobil to do more in the aviation space. Um, okay. So for, for us folk that travel with these permobil wheelchairs, of course, they get damaged very easily. Um, and often they can end up causing huge amounts of disruption. And I think as a wheelchair manufacturer, they've got a big part to play in how they help the aviation industry understand how better to handle their devices. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've managed to get them at a global level to start talking with airlines and airports and ground handlers about these chairs. So hopefully in the next couple of years, you'll start seeing some improvements around the handling of these devices and how Permobil can support you if things do go wrong when you're abroad. So I'm pushing right. that with them. Um, and uh, what was the other part to this? Uh, there was something else. Yeah, so I'm, um, I help them on an advisory board about new mm -hmm. innovations and what we want the future of Permobil wheelchairs to look like. Excellent. Excellent. You, you and I should have a conversation offline um, about that. Okay. It's interesting. Um, okay, next image is, let's talk purple. What's going on here? Hey, well, this is a fantastic picture. So that's Shani, uh, who you may have seen um, recently. She does a lot of work with big corporates, and she was recently on Loose Women. Uh, wonderful lady. And then in the middle, you've got a lovely gentleman called Andrew Douglas, who has a, um, a, a charity or a, a social enterprise called Parallel. Um, who have cre created a fund um, as part of Parallel called Purple Shop Day to raise money 
to support disabled entrepreneurs. So what happens is that their socks, you buy them for five pounds and they're to be worn on the December the 3rd, which is International Day of Persons with a Disability. And half of the money from each pair of socks goes into a fund that supports the, you know, the next generation of disabled entrepreneurs that want to, that have an idea, that want to start up their business. And uh, Andrew is just a fantastic guy and a supporter of it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, so this next pick is um, also on the theme of purple. Ah, uh, yes. Um, and you know, now, no it, doubt you'll be familiar with the phrase, nothing about us without us. I do, yeah. What does it mean to you, Josh? Oh, what a cool, that's a very good question. What does it mean to me? Um, do you know, you've got me here. Um, I think it's a really powerful statement that reminds people that you you can assume and do things that you think are right, but actually until you listen and understand and want to act on the things that you're hearing from us, you'll never be able to potentially truly include us. Um, and I think that's what we really mean by nothing about us without us. And um, I've been very fortunate where um, I've had a lot of people around me that really, you know, want to push me, encourage me and give me an environment that, you know, enables me to be the best person that I can. And I think that's what this campaign is about. It's empowering disabled people to be the best people that they can. Be. But in order to do that, we need to eradicate the barriers that are in society um, that prevent us from doing that. And, um, you know, we need businesses um, and governments to you know, address those problems so that, you know, you know, we can all have a, an equal path in life. I think the point you made earlier, which was for me very powerful, which is that, you know, we're both blessed with the support and the encouragement of good people around us um, who encourage, who nurture and, you know, who support us, right, in our, in our respective endeavours. I'm, I'm very mindful that there are many young people out there and families that don't have that support system around them. What would you, what, what a guidance or advice might you suggest to them? Um, I mean, for people that don't have the support around them, uh, I do some volunteering for SMA UK, uh, oh. and I highly encourage people to reach out to the local charities and leverage the support networks and the outreach communities that are there. They're there to help you um, to not feel isolated. And if mm. you haven't got the support, they've got the contacts um, and the resources to kind of help you um, get the support that you actually need. And often we find that there's people that might have you know, a social worker or perhaps an OT, and they might be quite frustrated with the way they are towards you. Um, and often you kind of feel lost because you're not really sure where to turn to, because normally I'd go to my family and they might help me. But if you're not if you're not fortunate enough, sometimes you've got you can't you rely on your social worker as your key person to help you get what you want. Um, and if you don't have a good relationship and you're finding it difficult to communicate, often the only other place you can really go to is a is a charity that can then support you and be that voice. So, I mean, yeah. I would highly encourage those that don't have that to reach out to their local yeah. charities like MUK, SMA UK, and get the support yeah. from there. Good call. Okay, let's move on to the next image. Here we go. Hey, okay, so that's for, for I, I mean, there's probably a lot of people in here that know that that's Mr. Corey Lee from the US. Um, and Corey is in Italy um, doing some trike tour um, around, around around Rome. Um, and he's actually sat in one of my, uh, he sat in one of our Able Sling lights, actually. Yes. So they've used it to lift him from his chair into this, into this bike. Um, and it's enabled him to go and explore all of the ruins in Rome. And for me, it kind of, there's something really empowering when you get somebody like myself that's developed something that's enabled Corey to go and experience something like that, that he may not, whilst he would have probably been able to experience it, the way in which he was able to get into that seat was a much more safer and dignified way to give him a much more comfortable um, yeah. and enjoyable experience. So, yeah. Next, next, next image. What's, what's, um, what's this all about? Well, firstly, it's pink. So unfortunately, <laughs> we have customers that like this colour. Um, it's, it's not my colour. It's a lovely colour. It's a lovely colour. It's one, it's one for the younger girls um, or, or the boys that actually like pink. So um, yeah. 
yeah, it's it's just a, another color of our wheelchair covers. Excellent. So where are we in this next image? Hey, so that is uh, Antigua. So we touched on it earlier. That's my father on the left. Um, and this was our first holiday on our own, actually. Um, and that was up at Shirley Heights. So if any of you ever get the opportunity, do go up to Shirley Heights. We, we were very unlucky on that day because it was very cloudy. Um, but just to let you know, be warned, there's no accessible toilet up there and it's very, very bumpy. <laughs> What's your father's name? Mark. Shout out to Mark. And we've got another pick here, which was the last in our series of picks. And um, what's going on here, Josh? Okay, so this was um, uh, uh, now. I need to refresh my memory, but this was uh, a thing ran by MD UK, where a artist had had uh, lots of photos um, and were asked. Uh, individuals with MD and SMA were asked to select a photo and explain what was meant by the photo or what does the photo represent to me and uh, interestingly i the photo reminded me of me and my dad which was the photo that you've just seen out in the caribbean and the boats represent um me and my dad and then you've got the kind of the sea um and the the, the peace and tranquility of just being out at sea uh with my dad on on a really nice holiday um and that's kind of what the photo meant to me. So I put that together nice. for MD UK. I think you can go and see it somewhere, actually. There was a, yeah. a description that I put together. I think if you head to Reflections in Colour, I think that's that was the, the, that's the name of the, the initiative, I think. Um, but uh, excellent. Thank you for that. And the last pick, I did say we'd come and revisit this particular topic because I know yes. that it is a topic uh, close to your heart. And I gather that in your spare time, Josh, when you've got spare time, you're currently training <laughs> to compete for Great Britain in air rifle shooting at the 2024 Paralympic Games in Paris. So, you know what, as an inspiring Paralympian, and what I think is the ultimate test of, of accuracy and skill, what's it going to take for you to be selected? Uh, a lot of sweat, a lot of tears, a lot of money. Um, and just, uh, I think actually the sport itself is, it's all to do with mindset. Um, it's, yeah. it's not a physical sport. Yeah. It's, it's all about your mental attitude and your willingness to, um, believe in yourself and to be able to focus. It's all about your internal, how you breathe, how you feel. Um, you know, I, there's something really amazing about air rifle that the moment you get behind that rifle, two things happen. You feel as though you, you've escaped. Um, you don't when you're behind the rifle you almost feel that you don't have a disability um, because you're able to compete against other people with or without disabilities with all different types of um, uh, abilities and so it creates a level playing field which is mm. really unique in this particular sport so it gives you that power um, and feeling that you don't have a disability subcon um, subconsciously but also what it does do is it tests your you're looking down the barrel of the rifle the, the 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 trick is to not let the outside thoughts of what's been going on in your life come into your mind so if you're busy with work relationships family all the things carers whatever you've got going on you have to switch off and to be able to have that mental skill to be able to just switch off is something that i don't think anybody can really master but you've just got to remind yourself to bring yourself back in and focus on what it is that you're doing. And it's, it's a bloody tough gig. I mean, Philip Jonsson, the young Swede, has done an absolute a remarkable job um, to have done what, or to achieve what he achieved in Tokyo. And I think it should be seen, uh, you know, to see people like me or Philip or just other people taking part, it should inspire hope. The, the the younger generation to get involved mm. because it, I, I can't really explain how it feels until you get behind the rifle and you get comfortable and experience it it's a feeling like no other i gather that air weapons are shot over uh, 10 meters and uh, 0.22 caliber weapons are shot over uh, 50 meters and i think there's also a 25 mm. meter um i was researching as you can tell a 25 meter pistol event so which one are you mm -hmm. which one are you kind of hoping to specialize in uh, so I, I want to do 10 meter air rifle, um, okay. pit, pistol, you need to use a spring stand, uh, pistol, you can't use a spring. So you have to have your arm completely straight out. So for most yeah. of us with MD and SMA, it's going to be 
obsolete. Um, but I can do I can do two two. There's nothing stopping me. But right now, at the moment, I need to focus on my core discipline, which is prone, which is using a table, which you saw in that photo, and a spring to support the rifle. And that is my main discipline that I'm focusing on at the moment. And then there's a couple of others, R4, which is using the spring, but not having a table. So you're not resting your elbows on the table. You've got your arms down beside beside you. Um, so yeah, that's that's the goal. I mean, Paris, I think Paris, if I if I buckle it up um, and I get my act together um, this year and I really train hard and focus, yeah, Paris is definitely achievable. Why would it not be? Um, but I've really got to go great guns this year to do it. I'm going to jump into the chat room. Uh, message from Chris. Very mm. inspiring to listen to you, Josh. A great role model. I'd certainly echo that. Thanks, and, Chris. Um, uh, Chris, a muscle warrior salute to, to Harry. Hope he's doing well um, this yeah. evening. Um, question for you, actually, uh, Josh. Who actually inspires you? Oh, um, it's, a re it's a really, really good question. Um, I think for me, it's probably, um, it's probably my nan. Um, she's probably the most inspirational person that I've ever come across. Um, so she did, she's done wonderful things for me. Um, my, my whole family have, but, um, I think, yeah, there's just something quite special about nan that inspires the, me to keep, you know, what's the, what? what's your nan's, what's your nana's name? Uh, Anne, or yeah, Anne, Anne. or if, if she's if she's in the doghouse, I call her Margaret, and she doesn't really like that very much. If she's tuning in this evening, you've heard it here. Um, yeah. You sound like an inspirational lady. So I'd like to move on to the universal human right of inclusion, right? Um, mm -hmm. A subject close to both of our hearts, Josh all about giving equal access and opportunities, eliminating the barriers of discrimination, um, you know, eradicating um, intolerance. When it comes to the, the journey or the evolution of uh, inclusion in our world today, and I'm, you know, I've kind of followed the conversation over the last, um, I suppose the last 25, 30 years, what progress have you seen, Josh, as you've, as you've gone about your day-to-day -day work that's a really good question. I think if we look at inclusion in general, where we were before the Equalities Act came in, yep. um, I think we've made huge progress um, in the grand scheme of things. I think, I, whilst we still have so many systematic barriers that prevent us from doing things that we want to do without having to argue or justify or, you know, really push for what we want, I think if we look at how fortunate we are where we can have housing, we can have carers that are paid for, um, we can have um, health care provided by us, where families, we can get support by the NHS. I mean, generally, we are very fortunate here in the UK, um, mm. I think, largely. Um, um, but I, when we look at, um, I don't know, if we look at business, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's been huge challenges over the last uh, 10, 10 years that I've seen with employment and only now are we starting to see employers becoming more confident with having people with disabilities in the workforce and of course that's that's driving huge change um because it's giving people employment opportunities and i think actually i always say to people technology in my opinion technology is the real reason as to what's driving all of this you know, we we look at these big corporations like your amazons your googles your microsofts and they're all making such huge amounts of money with whopping rate margins that they're able to invest those profits back into foundations. They're able to um, uh, they're able to give staff very good work life balances um, because they're able to pay for it. And I think technology has really enabled those companies to change the way in which we live. Um, and I think they've got a lot of answer for in terms of making the world more accessible because technology allows people like us with MD and SMA to have more job opportunities because we can do stuff behind a computer. Um, we can use different devices to make things more accessible um, and take part in different activities, um, whatever that might be. So I, th I think technology has a big reason to uh, a big Technology is, for me, the biggest reason why we've seen huge amounts of improvement in inclusion 
um, over the last kind of 20 years, in my opinion. And I have a tech background as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I think overall we've come a long way. We've still got a long way to go in certain areas. So if we look at housing uh, here in the UK, if we look at aviation, we've still got a long way to go. We're only really seeing the transport system really, you know, get their stuff together now yeah. with um, making their trains more accessible. So we're getting there, but I still think we've got a lot to fight for and we've got a lot to change. Um, and I, actually, for me, I think we're only at the beginning now. Um, I think a lot of the big, our, a lot of the big fighting has been done, but we just need to keep that momentum up um, and keep pushing for the change. And we, we just need people to stick to that. If I may, Josh, I'd like to chat about your recent appointment um, at mm. a research design and innovation consultancy that's all about making environments work better for, for all of us. So here's a shout mm. out to, to Open Inclusion, which I think is the name of the organization. Am I right in saying, Josh, that you're, that you're going to be their panel community lead on specifically mobility and dexterity? So what's, what's that mm. about? So I took over from a, a fabulous man, Martin Sibley, who you will probably be very familiar with. Um, and I took over to help uh, Open Inclusion with giving insight to the, the challenges that people with uh, mobility and dexterity problems have. And that could range from anything to um, using some hand soap, to using your mobile phone, to booking a holiday, to um, a you know getting care it could be to do with anything that re disability um but particularly give my insight from a, a dexterity and mobility point of view um and actually what i because they're a research company um they support a lot of very big organizations that want to understand how better to support their disabled customer base and when you're in research environment often that is normally where innovation comes from or where they where they want to develop a new idea or have an existing product or service and change it to, to to meet a wider range of users and actually for me there's something really special about being part of research and innovation and i think from my background with developing my business and other um ventures that i've got in my own mind um you know it's just it's just a such a special place to work and i think what drawn me to them um, and I think a lot of people need to take this away if they're looking for employment in the future, is that you want to be working with an organisation that values you in terms of who you are, but also embraces your disability. And I think because they are a, uh, you know, um, a disability organisation um, with lots of their, a lot of their workforce is disabled, um, it's just a very nice place to work yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. very understanding. And I think it just makes it makes it so much more enjoyable. Good stuff. Listen, I'm going to jump into the chat room. David, uh, I'm just going to pick okay. the pace up a little bit here, Josh. Um, David yeah. said, uh, what technological development um, would you want us to work on next? So a brief answer by me, Josh, on this one. Um, I would probably be looking at something to do with um, travel, um, anything technology development that you can do within the travel sector, um, I think would be huge. Um, there's something I'm, I've got my my eyes on at the moment, and I have been for a while. Um, but I just think there's so much space in the travel and tourism industry that can really utilise technology more. So I think that's where I would be asking people to focus on. Maybe you can teleport me one day to Antigua. Um, that would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, I understand that you're ambassador for Lena yeah. Cheshire um, and that you yep. mentioned earlier that you work as a young support volunteer for Spinal Muscular Atrophy UK. So just briefly, yep. um, two charities sure. I know that you're connected with. Um, they do tremendous mm -hmm. work, I know, but um, a particular message that you wanted to convey to either of those? Uh, I mean, they've got, a, they've got a very close place to my heart, Leonard Cheshire um, and SMA. Leonard Cheshire was through the Stelios Awards mm. um, and the team there kind of really liked what I did. And I said I'd like to offer my support back to them in terms of helping them as ambassador. Um, and they're just, a, again, I think they're going through a cultural shift and I like the direction they're going in. Uh, in terms of supporting people with disabilities to uh, become independent and become more employable. And then we've also got uh, SMA UK, um, which, of course, as you know, uh, with uh, the dis my disability, I support them tremendously. I love giving back to the younger versions of, of, of myself. Um, I've got a one lad that's got a very close 
place in my heart. Um, he's a spitting image of me when I was his age. Um, and I, I keep a very close eye on him. And I, there's just something really nice about sharing what you've learned with others to make sure that they don't necessarily not make the same mistakes, but don't have to go through some of the challenges that I had to go through. Nice. Gear change. So it's that time again for our second quick fire round. Josh, are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Good. Here we go. Best bit of advice that you give your younger self? Um, so it would be, uh, other than uh, pushing people up with negativity, it would be what my nan always said to me, and that's put can't in your pocket and pull out, try. Nice. <clears throat> Tonight's dinner, who cooked it? Uh, <laughs> nan. <laughs> Shout out to nan again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so question, when do you think we'll see a society that's totally inclusive? A, 10 years, B, 25 years, C, 50 years? In brief, can there be a can can there be an option for D and say I don't think we'll ever achieve true inclusion. Um, I, I I really don't think we will ever achieve it. But I'll, I'll go for the longest possible, and I'm going to say fifty years. Josh, what's your food heaven? It's oh, food gosh. you love. Uh, probably probably steak pie, chips, and gravy and veg. I would probably go for most used tech gadget. Uh, my iPhone. First job, the first job that you dreamed of having as a kid. Uh, RAF pilot. Oh. We do need to have a conversation afterwards. Uh, what percentage <laughs> most? <laughs> what percentage most accurately represents those with disabilities on boards across the globe? Is it A. 0.5 percent, B. 2 percent, or C. 4.5 percent? So I'm going to go, so originally it was 2% that jumped in my head. Um, so I'm going to go 2%. Yeah. yeah. And finally, if someone was to play Josh Wintersgill in a movie, um, who would you want it to be? Um, I would probably go for uh, Tom Hanks. That's a nice segue to our next uh, bit of this conversation. Josh, speaking of movies, come on then, let's talk briefly about your two favourite uh, movies. Here they are. Um, yeah, yeah. What's it? What's it about them that you particularly love? Um, so Forrest Gump, for me, was kind of. I I always forget that scene where he had his his leg braces on, and um, his mum says something to him. Says uh, he says, uh, what does she say? Don't don't ever let anybody tell you um, different. Or she says something, and I think it just really resonated with me when you know i was told you know to never let anybody say you can't do something I and mean, i think that was when he was a young boy and i was a young boy when i was told that and i just felt there was kind of that similarity with him obviously he was the opposite he broke out of his braces and started running and i stayed in my braces and ended up in a chair so you know, it's kind of a bit opposite um but it, there was just something really nice about that story and the way in which it was delivered and then the untouchables i think it's such a, a an interesting movie where you've got that relationship between a, a chappie who has obviously been paralyzed um, and it obviously had a very wealthy chap and a carer that comes from a very kind of rough background. And I think the relationship of how they came to meet um, and it, it goes to show that it's all about the personality of somebody and you can, you can bring them in into a care role. They don't necessarily have to have all of the skills, but it's how you actually get on with that person yeah. that makes that relationship yeah. so unique. And I think that's something for me that is really powerful now is that it's you need to have carers that you can have fun with. Everything else can come after that because if you've got yeah. carers and people around you that make it hard work, then you can't be happy. <laughs> Do you know what? I think we could probably spend another hour talking about the the uh, the interaction and the interplay between carers and, and so on. Um, anyway, where's your happy place, Josh, moving on? <laughs> so my bed, so my happy place is probably my bed. <laughs> I, lo I absolutely love my bed. Um, if I if I'm not behind the rifle, it's probably my bed. Um, I or being outdoors. I mean, I love being outdoors um, and sightseeing and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I've got a few happy places. Good. Even the hydro pool being another one. Nice. Who makes Josh laugh out loud? Um, probably Boris Johnson today with his party. Um, <laughs> He's been kind of getting me going a little bit. Um, but no, uh, probably Lee Evans or the late yep. Jethro, who just recently passed away, sadly. 
Josh, if you could invite two celebrities to your home for a pot of tea, um, who would mm. they be? Uh, I think that would, oh, there's three. It would probably be uh, uh, Elvis, Elvis Presley and maybe Winston Churchill. But my third, and it's really hard, is probably Sir Alex Ferguson. Okay. I can't food decide. Hell? Josh's food uh, Egg mayo sandwich is just horrific. He, nobody likes egg mayo sandwiches. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I love a decent egg mayo sandwich. And if my favourite no. son-in-law is tuning in this evening, he 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 will he he really makes good egg mayo sandwiches, right? <sighs> um, anyway, penultimate there's, question, there's Josh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us about yeah. one or two goals um, that you want to uh, achieve, um, you know, in your life over the next. I don't. Know. So, so yeah, so I mean, there there is there is two i think i of course i would i want to become an apparel a paralympian that is that is my goal um and i'd like to think i'd achieve that if i if i don't then um i definitely want to set up my own care agency at some point but i also um would like to set up a foundation similar to yourself at some point much later on in my life when the time is right um i i do believe in um you know the, the kind of giving back and the philanthropic world um, and I would really very much like to be able to do that at some point in the future as well um, and just see where it goes. But who knows? Who, we, we might get there. We might not. I look forward to one day maybe having a game of poker with you because I understand you're a bit of a... Play a, play a little bit of poker from time to time. I think we had a little bit of, a bit of um, interference there, but hopefully that's cleared now. Final question, Josh, if you can hear me. Can you hear me clearly? I can. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. So to close off tonight's show, uh, Joff, you, you've been a terrific guest. If there's just maybe one thing that we can all do to perhaps make the world uh, a slightly better place, what would it be? Uh, it would be to smile and be kind. I'm just going to jump back into the chat room very briefly. David's um, uh, put in a questionnaire about how, how we should go about fighting for true inclusion. And, you know, I've got a view on that, but I'd like to hear your view briefly, Josh, just on how we can keep that that fight going. Yeah. I think I think the fight for true inclusion starts with children. Um, I think once you once you get out of childhood I, as adults, we start to then form opinions. And I think what we need to be doing is ingraining inclusion into children as if it's education so that actually it becomes the norm. So we actually subconsciously are always doing inclusive things without even realizing we're doing it. And I think if we can get to that point um, where society becomes natural thinkers and doers around inclusion by educating children from the get-go, I think that's probably the best place that we can start because you know the generation we have now, we, it, whilst you can always change people's mindsets um, and viewpoints, I think doing it much earlier on, we stand a much better chance. Huge thanks, Josh Wintersgill, for being our guest tonight. Here's my best muscle warrior salute from me to you, Josh. And for those yeah, that don't know, this mine. is a, a visible symbol of hope, courage, strength, joy, and unity for all those with muscular dystrophy. And what I'd like to do is, if you've enjoyed tonight's show, please, please head on over to musclehelp.com forward slash power of 657 where you can support our 100K Power 657 fundraising appeal. And on this page, uh, you'll see how your donations will enable the Muscle Foundation charity to push on uh, in delivering hopefully many more muscle dream interventions in 2022 for children and young people, just like Bertie here with muscular dystrophy across the UK. Thank you. And Josh, as is the custom, if perhaps you... You know someone who you think would make a great in conversation with guest for our new series that kicks off in March 2022. Please do let me know. Of course. I mean, I could give you some, I could give you a couple of names um, already um, and I will, well, I have I will a thing endeavor to do that afterwards. That's yes. Brilliant. Nice yes, one. I've already, yeah. So here we go. Drum roll. Breaking news, as is the custom. Breaking news. We're back for another show on Wednesday, the 2nd of February where we'll be chatting about disabled friendly holiday and specifically an innovative travel company called Limitless Travel. 
uh, from luxury escorted tours allowing people with disability to experience new insights and cultures in comfort from Britain to beyond. I'll be chatting with its founder and the CEO, Angus Drummond. Now, Angus is someone I've met several years ago um, over some lunch in a restaurant in Milton Keynes. And you'll have to tune in uh, in a few weeks' time to find out what exactly unfolded. And from being a 22-year-old investment banker to a diagnosis of muscular dystrophy, uh, to them being told one day that he be confined uh, to a wheelchair, a devastating shock for anyone. But for Angus, who spontaneously quit his job, his story of travel and his love of travel began uh, in that moment. He and his beautiful wife set off clocking over 35 countries that included canoeing in Vietnam and climbing to the top of Machu Picchu. Angus's first-hand experience of traveling the world with a disability saw limitless travel born. The rest as they say, is history. In Angus's own words, limitless travel is more than a travel company. To be limitless is a mindset. It means to push yourself to experience things you didn't think it possible to achieve. So once again, you're all invited. Do join me on Wednesday, the 7th of February, uh, Wednesday, the 2nd of February uh, at 7.30 p.m. Once again, on behalf of the Muscle Foundation Charity, Big thanks to tonight's guest, Josh Wintersgill, and to our StreamYard volunteer studio team, uh, to Kate and to Nick, and of course, to tonight's studio lead, to Grace, for once again, making it all happen behind the scenes. You guys rock. For now, have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.